Hey, everybody. How we doing? <laughs> Welcome to Word Balloon, the Comfa Conversation Show. It's uh, John Sutris here, and uh, I'm I am thrilled that uh, Chip Zdarsky is joining us today. Nice face. Where else am I going to be? I understand. <laughs> There's literally nowhere else I can go. I I, I do understand, but yeah. uh, it's good to see you, buddy. And good to uh, see you. Yeah, and I, and especially given that uh, I know. Uh, how a, how much of a hassle it's become in terms of you traveling down to the lower 48 for conventions. So at least we do get to see each other face to face for a change. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel like weirdly I'm seeing more people now than I've seen in a long time, just because we're all craving connection. Sure. It's all of a sudden my friends, I'm talking to them more often. Like, like, you know, I've hit that age where like, I'll see my friends once every six months for a beer. But now we're like checking in every like week or two, and uh, yeah, that that part's kind of nice. Well, you know, um, I uh, and also uh, for people who are like, "Hey, how come this isn't on YouTube?" I uh, I wanted to try this on Twitter instead. Mm -hmm. So, uh, oh, and look, Henry Barajas is uh, saying we are all craving a chip. Oh God! So it's not um, nice. Yeah, feel free to send me if there's a Twitter link too. I'll uh, I'll tweet yeah, that. I'm gonna out. see. I, I want to see if uh, what the deal is while we're talking and everything, but. Um, Hey man, uh, you're you're oh, kicking wow. ass, and I'm I'm thrilled with what you've been doing. Um, oh, thanks. You know, yeah, in the in in the funny books and all. Um, let's see if it's uh, got a thing here. Funny books, I remember those. Yep. And um, you know, God, both there it is. Um, yeah, okay, <laughs> great. So now, do I send this to? I'm going to send this to your. I just tweeted it out. I'm one oh, step ahead it? of you, like a Bond supervillain. All right, good deal. So yeah, here we are, folks, on uh, on Twitter and Facebook for a change because I wanted to see how this plays, and just because more people follow me on uh, Twitter and Facebook than than on YouTube, so we'll see. I'm but tired uh, of your bragging, yeah. bragging, bragging, bragging. Well, we already got forty five people watching, so maybe this was a good move. <laughs> uh, Fifty people. Whoa! So, you know where to go, but down. You know exactly. <laughs> All right. So we'll take your comments and uh, and your questions. But certainly, I uh, I have uh, my own uh, thoughts that I, I want to share with uh, our buddy here. All right, and I'm gonna play with all my bells and whistles live as we're doing this. Cool, um, it's, a good, it's a good setup. I feel like I'm on CNN or something. I know. <laughs> Franco drew me as Larry King with like the oh, CNN really? background and everything. <laughs> yes, with the uh, with the suspenders and everything. Absolutely, and it's great because I have like devices on my table, but I've got a tin can with string. You, you, yeah, you are kind of comics, Larry King. Take that as you will. <laughs> I've been married seven times, and I like to take <laughs> garlic for my uh, heart condition. There you go. I like your Spidey mug. Very nice. That's beautiful. It's the only um, piece of comic memorabilia I have except for <laughs> – just one second. Just one second. Show me. He's off to uh, find uh, more paraphernalia, so this is great. Except for this bad boy. Very nice. Of. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, this was uh, I, I don't normally have, like, I'd say nerd stuff, but uh, I used to do, like, paintball adventures in the woods with my buddies, like, once a year. And I, I had to buy this. I just had to. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, so if you look close, you can see it's all scratched up and there's, like, paintball remnants on it. But that's and, good. Uh, and it yeah, shows that it's battle worn. That's wonderful, man. Yeah, it's there's no greater feeling than running through the woods, and <laughs> and hearing and feeling paintballs like ping off your Captain America shield. <laughs> like I'm a grown ass man, and like that's a thrill. I have a I have a buddy who uh, works at WBBM Radio in Chicago, and he's a massive Cap fan, and has a hoodie that has the cowl oh, for yeah, the hoodie, yeah. and he has a he has a life size shield as well. And yeah. uh, I forget how many different uh, cap creators he's had uh, sign in oh, and really? stuff like that. Yeah, that's awesome. So the, Dean, um, Dean Haspel yeah. checking in. Good to see you, Dean. Yeah, yeah, he's looking great. He's looking better than ever with half his face covered. Frankly, Dean, Dean is like seriously ageless, and I'm not just saying it because you're here, Dean. Seriously, <laughs> you wear your fifties much better than I do, Dean. So well done. <laughs> just say uh, that right away. I was gonna say so. So this mug, I went to a comic store opening. Uh, which it was like an open bar and I got really drunk and um, there were no more cups left for booze. Uh, and I couldn't find mine. So I just grabbed this off the shelf and I filled it with booze and started drinking. I'm like, I guess I just bought it. It's like you, you broke it, you bought it. 
So I came uh, home with it, and it, it's like my favorite mug. That's a great I, mug. I should get. That's a really good idea. I should definitely do that. I have an Invaders '70s Invaders uh, Pilsner glass. Oh, nice. that's that's really nice, and it has it's the cover with uh, Union Jack in the forefront. Mm. That's what that's what they use and everything. So, um, yeah. so we talked about your Invaders run, which was excellent. It ended oh, quite thanks. well. Thanks. Absolutely. Last time we talked, yeah, it was Invaders and Spider Man Life Story. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly we'll take questions on those. But right now, and then it continues, uh, the great Daredevil run. And uh, man, the pandemic came at uh, the worst possible time because <laughs> uh, this is like, you know, finally uh, Matt's back, you know, at, at least in the cowl. And, yeah. uh, and Typhoid, Typhoid Mary is suddenly revealing herself. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he's about to face Bullseye, and obviously Mary's got to be a heartbeat away. Yeah, yeah. We want to throw in as many villains as possible for this kind of the end of the first year arc. Um, and the Mary stuff had been planned from the beginning, so we were pretty excited to finally reveal her. Uh, yeah, I know. 19 ended on like this cliffhanger, this really cool moment of him with the mask on again. And then it's like, all right, comics are done. Yikes. Were you ever in a pencils down situation or did they, you know, yeah. were you able to keep going? I, I, I mean, I think all of us were on one project or another. I had, um, I had one project that was in the kind of the green light stage where we were talking about artists and um, uh, I was, I was doing the outline uh, and, and that was pencils down, um, which wasn't, you know, wasn't too bad because I hadn't really started it. And there's another possibility of a of a book, like a mini series, down the line, which had the pencils down, and then there was a one shot that was stopped, um, which sounds like a lot, but they're all just kind of like potential things. Okay. So none of them really hit me hard because I was like, okay, like I planned to kind of just do Daredevil really um, as the main book, and, uh, and and that's been continuing on. So so that's been nice. Excellent, yeah. great run, man. Honestly, cool. a lot Thanks. of fun and. Um... Echoes of um, Born Again in in some ways. I very mean, conscious, very conscious. It's my favorite superhero story, um, and it's like it's like a template for superhero stories now. Like just to break a character down and build them back up. And I just wanted to kind of attempt to do it um, over a longer period, maybe going uh, kind of deeper into the effects of violence on a hero, not just him like struggling to get back up and punch again, but like um, really question whether or not he should. Uh, but yeah, Born Again is the best um, Marvel uh, run of all time, probably, I think. I'm with you. Absolutely, yeah. man. No, and uh, and yeah, it's the tough act to follow in Frank Miller. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, honestly, I, I think this, your run has been great and um, oh, thanks. wonderful to see. Well, and also like a much more fragile uh, Kingpin as opposed to in Born Again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fun playing with him because you're always trying to find, like you understand that like kind of every story has been told, but if you could find a new way into a character, um, that's what makes a project sing. And with Fisk, I really wanted people to have empathy for him. I wanted him to just kind of feel like uh, a guy keeps attempting to be something that he's not. And him as mayor was such a, an amazing decision uh, in Charles Soule's run to have that happen. Yeah. Um, because that's the pathway to like being legit. Uh, but people will always view him a certain way and sure. trying, trying to overcome that. And especially with the idea of like, you know, old rich versus new rich is kind of the, the conflict I wanted to explore there and what that would uh, do to a guy like Kingpin, who's always going to be seen as like, just like this brutal dude who, uh, who murdered his way to the top. And I love the owl being there as well, and also yeah. kind of a kind of a des new design for the owl—a little younger, a little a little—I um, I don't even know the word—but just well, to look, you know, a little more human. It's impossible for Marco to draw anyone ugly; <laughs> like he just can't do it. And so, like, the owl looks cool as hell. Stilt man looks cool as hell. Sure. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's, a, it's a, a side effect of his art that I've just tried to lean into. Like at first, when we started working together, I was like. Oh man, like uh, I kind of want these characters to feel a bit more like downtrodden and beat up and rough around the edges. And um, uh, Marco just can't help himself but make everyone look beautiful, like supermodels. 
like even Fisk is, you know, probably more attractive than he's been in decades in this run. Um, what's the kind of what Mark about? You kind of you kind of lean into it and go, yeah, okay, all these characters are cool and beautiful, and um, that's just something we have to work with. Very cool. Oh, look, Matthew yeah. Rosenberg says, I love you, Chip. And then it's interesting, and I'm glad he put up the... <laughs> I'm glad he's got the Punisher logo. Me too. Well, I was going to say, because I've, I've, been, <laughs> I've, been I've been loving Marco's stuff ever since he and Rocco were doing uh, the Punisher. Chip. Yeah, yeah. And he's he's a revelation. It's one of those situations where I kind of knew going in that this was going to be the project that was going to... Um, get a lot of eyes on Marco and that they were going to steal him from me at some point. <laughs> and it's always a worry. Like I'm not, I'm not saying that it's happened, but um, there have always been discussions about, Oh, maybe we should have Marco do this and Marco do that. I'm like, uh, let's, let's keep him on this book as long as he wants to be on the book and not make him feel like he has to like go draw an event book or something that would be seen as a, a, a bigger title maybe. Um, because you have so much more leeway on a book like this as artist and writer uh, to kind of do what you want. And um, so far he's, he's really into it, uh, which is That's great. great. It's great for me and it's great for the readers because that means he'll, he'll stick around as long as we can keep him. Yeah. He's a great kind of resonant Marvel pulp sort mm -hmm. of artist. And I, I really, I'm, I'm thrilled that he is happy with the run. Is it, um, is it going to be just 24 or how many, uh, like how long are you on the book? I mean, I'm on it until they kick me off or, okay, um, or I feel like it's time to go. Like in the past, um, I tend to walk away from a title when I feel like I've said what I needed to say. Sure. Uh, you don't want to overstay your welcome. Um, and, uh, and it'll be the same with this. But the thing about the Daredevil book is you can kind of do whatever you want on it. Like if you kind of get a little stuck in a rut going down this path, you can really um, do whatever you feel with the character because he does stand on his own. Uh, not like other Marvel characters. Like you can't do whatever you want with Spider-Man, obviously, because he kind of represents the company. You know, X-Men characters, you got to tie into X-Men. Sure. Um, most characters are kind of like circling the Avengers or other teams. Um, Whereas Daredevil is just, it, it, it's its own thing. So you can kind of, you can take more chances with it. And, you know, I like, you know, Mark Wade did that um, when he moved him to San Francisco and went for a much lighter tone. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, and the scent, he took him to just, took him literally to hell <laughs> with the Silver <laughs> Surfer and Mephisto and Karnak, like just wild stuff um, that I don't think he get a, could get away with in another uh, another title, you know? I do. Uh, yeah. Here's a good question from uh, Tyler Janis. Uh, he wants to know when are we going to get another podcast episode of Chipping Away with Chip Zdarsky. Now, is that your own podcast or is that you with Stegman or whoever? Or, um, or, 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 or. That, that, that might be the, 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 the podcast I did where I took over Stegman's in which I basically showed him how it's done. <laughs> like up until that point, his, his podcast was pretty routine um, pretty basic. He would just kind of like stumble over himself when talking to anybody, cut them off. Uh, like it, it's weird when you can hear someone sweat in a podcast, you know, like that's a, that's a weird sensation, but that's how you feel when you listen to his podcast, right? You're killing me. No, it's true. And, uh, <laughs> and so I took over and basically brought on a ton of guests, a lot of fun, a lot of music. Um, I think it's their most listened to podcast that they've, uh, they've That's done. That's fantastic. That's, that doesn't surprise me. That's excellent, um, man. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those things. I'd, I'd love to do it again, but um, uh, I also like to go out on top. You know, I think we, <laughs> we accomplish what we need to. We set the template for Ryan. It's up to him whether or not to pick that up and figure out how to do his job properly. So, right. yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> Do you, would you want to do, I mean, would you have time to do a podcast? I mean, you know, I'm surprised Ryan does, frankly, because, you know, drawing a book is uh, pretty work intensive and stuff. Although this is yeah. probably like, you know, him screwing around and stuff. So yeah, that's anything he can do to not draw, he'll do. You know, he's an artist. That's how artists work. <laughs> 
that's how most creative people work. Any project they can do that takes them away from what they should be doing. Um, I, I don't know. I, I've toyed with it before. Um, the idea of doing a podcast. But there's there's so many of them, and there's people like you that know what they're doing. People like Ryan that don't know what they're doing. It's like, what, <laughs> you know, where do I stand and all that? But my favorite thing I did was um, years ago. I was just reminded of this yesterday uh, when Kieran Gillen had a podcast where he was interviewing creators. Yeah, um, he let me have a little segment, a pre-recorded thing, where I had like a little theme song about like Chip asking questions, <laughs> and every. Uh, Every episode, it would be the same question, which would just be me going, where do you get your ideas? And that would be it. <laughs> and then, like, some people would kind of get the joke, and then some people would try and answer earnestly. And um, I think that's that's what I want to be remembered for in Lovely. podcasting. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, oh, this is nice. Uh, James Dean wanted to thank you for hanging out with his comic book club in January. And he says, ignore the question mark. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wasn't invited, uh, but it was, it was great just to, to bust in the doors and, um, say hi. It's like a real live panel. Thank you, Mercy Madonna. It, it is like a real live panel. That's the intent, uh, for these things. And that's, mm -hmm. that's why it's been fun, you know, and again, weird byproduct of the, of the virus and stuff. I mean, uh, how, yeah. how are you handling, uh, the lockdown? Um, you know, life is not that much different. <laughs> Uh, just because, you know, I work from home. The only difference now is my wife also works from home. Um, uh, I didn't realize how often I went to coffee shops. Now I know. Yeah. Yeah. We kind of, we kind of locked down early, um, like a week or two before everyone else did just because we have relatives in China that kind of like gave us a, wow. Kind of gave us a bit of a heads up. Like we were kind of experiencing what they were experiencing, uh, what they're going through and, um, so we kind of knew how bad it could get. And then uh, uh, I also have some lung issues. So um, we, we, we decided to, to lock it down pretty early. Uh, yeah. So the first Smart. week or so, like, we were walking in the street avoiding people, and people looked at us like we were just nuts. And then by week two, half the people thought we were nuts, and now, like, no one thinks we're nuts. So validation. That's cool. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you, you know, uh, me, Tom King, and a bunch of us, and I'm sure a lot of our mutual friends were at uh, the Chicago convention C2E2 before. Mm. That was the yeah. last the last show before everything got shut down. Yeah, and and it was really a weird weekend because yeah, we we were kind of social distancing. We weren't shaking hands. Uh, I had gloves. Yeah, because I had heard. I'm like, all right, you know, whatever. And then literally, I was driving to work on Monday morning and listening to the news radio station I used to work at. And they're like, uh, McCormick place will uh, be canceling its events. Uh, and I'm like, Oh sure. You know, let's kill off the nerds. You know, <laughs> yeah. 90,000 nerds. Fuck those guys. Uh, but, you can't stop nerds No. Yeah. So, and it's crazy. Seriously. Like King and I were talking the whole week afterwards and both of us felt run down. And mm -hmm. it's like, uh, I, I don't think I have it. Do you, do you think you have it? No, I, I, I don't, but I really do feel bad. Yeah, me too, but I don't have a fever. So, and then by Friday, yeah. I felt normal again. No, you know, it's just old man being tired from a convention kind of thing. Yeah, that was, that was the weird period. Like, like the first week or two, um, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd start coughing. I'd be like, oh, oh, this is it. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Um, like, basically yeah. just thinking about, like, just before we locked down, like, all my interactions. And you're just waiting it out to see uh, if you've got something. And now with seasonal allergies, you know, I, I, I yeah. get to fear once in a while but. I'm the same way, man. No, I'm, I, I've just got just a shadow of what I used to get with allergies and really mm. bad sinus infections. I don't get sinus infections anymore. But uh, yeah. well, back to fun stuff. And uh, uh, Iranga D, am I saying that right? I think so. Best friends after your Hero Initiative Zoom call. You don't write. You don't call. Bummer. I, I, I am a monster. I'm a, a love them and leave them kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> if you um, Zoomed with me. You're ghosted. That's it. That's awesome, though, that you did that. That's great that you did that with the Hero Initiative. Uh, yeah, we, we've done a man. bunch of them, like the Hero Initiative stuff. And then uh, I did, like, God, like 10 podcasts um, to support comic shops here in Canada. That's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then they're all fun. Like, I, I enjoy doing them. It's just, uh, again, the seasonal allergies, and then my voice starts to disappear. And I'm like, oh, okay. Maybe I can't do this all the time. Jeez. Weak old man. When you when you were growing up, Chip, did you ever see a show, uh, a Toronto public television show, Prisoners of Gravity? Oh, I love Prisoners of Gravity. 
I haven't I haven't released it yet. I was talking about it with uh, with Tom Fowler, um, but I had I, I did I recorded an interview with Rick Green that I'll be putting out probably probably with this uh, as a companion to this podcast. Did you Did you talk to Mark Asquith? I and you know it's awesome. Um, Fowler is going to put me in touch with Mark. Yeah, he's amazing. He's like a Toronto institution. Like, um, uh, I, I loved that show when I was in high school, and I didn't know who Mark was, who produced it. Mm-hmm. Um, and co-created, I, I suppose. And uh, uh, later on, when I became friends with them, you know, I found that out. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. And then I also found out he um, he used to run the Silver Snail comic shop in Toronto, and he organized one of their huge events around Spider-Man's uh, wedding. <laughs> and brought in like a Spider-Man cosplayer, official guy from Marvel, and then John Romita Sr., which was like a huge moment for me as a kid, like getting to meet him and wow, coming to coming into into Toronto to to do all that. So like. Yeah, it's weird. Like Mark's had this strange effect in my life, and I didn't know until I, I met him years later that he was responsible for this. Um, That's outstanding, man. You know, I um, Mark Leferrier uh, introduced me to uh, Rick, and or at least knew I had been talking about Prisoners of Gravity, and I love watching the YouTube things. We didn't get it down here. Yeah. Um, you know, we got it, but we didn't get it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then it was great to see it, and um, he's like, "Hey, do you want to talk to Rick Green?" And I'm such a putz because uh, I usually, and seriously, man, I am a, a Canadian comedy fan. Yeah. And I did not realize and put two and two <laughs> together, first of all, that he was in Red Green. Yeah. But even better, in the 80s, he was part of the Frantics. Yeah. And, dude, Dr. Demento used to play Frantics bits all the time yeah. to the head and, and all of it. And I'm just like, oh, my God. And, you know, he just kind of casually, as we were talking, is like, Oh, you know, and then yeah, I was doing some stuff in the, the Frantics. I'm like, I remember the Frantics. Yeah, I'm like, I know who you are. You're very funny. Yeah. So uh, oh, he's, I, I got to get an him institution. Back. Yeah. Yeah, I got to get him back to talk about that stuff because he was like, Hey, can we just talk for like 40 minutes? And I'm like, Yeah, sure. I'm like, That's plenty yeah. of time. It's cool. And he also wanted to talk about what he's doing now with uh, uh, ADHD, uh, the attention deficit, and I don't remember what the HD stands for. It's not high definition. Uh, but it's in really sharp. Yeah. You can really yeah. tell. But honestly, uh, he sent me a video that he made for people to kind of, he's like, look, I'm not a doctor, but you might want to check this out. And I think I might have it. I don't know. I, I go off into tangents. I, I'm, you know, creative guy. And some of the the negative things that come with creativity, I, I kind of yeah. see at least enough to check it out. And that's yeah. okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like, Oh my God, you know, it's, it's okay. And I mean, he's a living example of a guy that is living with it and, and still very productive and everything. Yeah. Yeah. But, I think, I think a lot of people in comics um, have ADHD to one degree or another. Um, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, it, I mean, the, all, all of our editors probably think we do, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah Cause there, there are bursts of like not being able to focus and then bursts of like hyper-focus, which can also be a symptom um, yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, diagnosed with it. Um, my doctor refuses to give me pills. He thinks I'll abuse literally every pill. <laughs> He's probably right. That's hilarious. Jesus. But, uh, oh, you got, you got, you got heartburn. And I'm like, yeah. And then I'll down like a hundred heartburn pills. Just become addicted to them. Uh, no, don't put a pill in front of me. I guess. All yeah. right. Fair enough. What, uh, where are you with sex criminals right now? Um, uh, well, issue 29 has been done for a while. Just kind of sitting with the image, kind of waiting to figure out where it's going to go. Sure. Um, Matt literally just texted me, um, before I got onto this, uh, podcast saying that he just finished the draft of issue 30. Oh, cool. Um, and in the meantime, I've been doing, um, I've been drawing, uh, other stuff, which hasn't been announced. Okay. Um, yeah, because with, with everything kind of in flux, um, I think Matt and I both agreed, like, okay, let's do the jobs that are paying right now. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, because uh, with, the, with the diamond situation, yeah. like, image is very, very much relies on the, the diamond money coming in to, uh, to pay the creators because it's a very direct thing. Sure. Um, uh, we were just unsure, you know, if issue 30 was going to come out, if issue 30 was going to come out in any kind of form that where we make money. Um, and this is going back a few weeks. Like we're a lot more um, assured now that things will kind of get back to some semblance of normal. But, uh, but at the time we're just like, okay, 
we had a couple of like company gigs that came up. We're like, okay, we should probably do these because these will be things that will for sure come out and, uh, and uh, pay our mortgages. I understand man. Have, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm happy that uh, the interesting timing, it wasn't planned, but watching uh, Brubaker and Marcos Martin with mm -hmm. the panel syndicate and everything. Yeah. And not that you guys would ever, or, you know, both obviously not with sex criminals, which is an image book, mm -hmm. but while this has been going on and also seeing the inherent flaws of having only one distributor, are you exploring mm -hmm. other possibilities for putting out your stuff comic wise? Yeah. So, I mean, when all this hit, I had three creator owned books besides sex criminals kind of in various stages of uh, early development mm -hmm. um, with contracts being kind of drawn up and uh, everything just kind of paused. And um, uh, yeah, we, we all, we all kind of stopped and, start putting out ideas as to, as to how these projects could come out, um, whether or not it was worth waiting or doing them without any kind of uh, cash advances to kind of figure out uh, if, if it's going to be worth it, if the, if the world is going to want these. Um, I, I realized during all this talking to a bunch of comic creators that uh, I'm uh, very old and very tired all the time. And, the hustle and initiative that everyone's showing and like, you know, their Kickstarters the Patreons, um, panel syndicate, like figuring out new ways to d deliver product. Um, I, uh, I get tired reading a Kickstarter. Like I Jeff, think. Jeff Lemire and, and, and Matt Kent yeah. uh, doing the, the cosmic detective. I'm like, yes. oh, this is amazing. And I'm reading the Kickstarter. I'm just like, Oh, this is exhausting. It's exhausting just like reading a Kickstarter. I couldn't imagine like doing it and then like being stressed about that number every day and like always having the hustle. And um, I think I just got, I'm, I've gotten comfortable in, in terms of like um, you produce a thing, you hand it to somebody, they do it, you get paid, yay, you do it again. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, and that's, that's a flaw. I've, I've, gotten, I've gotten comfortable. And uh, I should probably kind of get out there and hustle a bit and uh, figure out one of these kind of crowdfunding things. But I'm also an idiot. So, uh, like, well, what am I going to crowdfund? Like, uh, like a sexy calendar? I don't know. I don't know what I, what I have to offer the world. Um, I hate myself. I hate my work. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's worth money to people. Um, I mean, you're paying me handsomely to do this, obviously, because I'm worth it. Yeah. But uh, other than this, I don't know. I don't I know. Understand. So, so yeah. So with all the projects, um, we're still going ahead with like issue ones, and I'm still doing proper pitches to places. Um, uh, so I know they'll come out, but I don't know when, and I don't know in what format. Maybe we end up doing Kickstarters. I don't know if my heart can take it, but. Uh, that level of rejection, not hitting my Kickstarter goal. <laughs> well, that's why they got GoFundMe. You know, that's you know, yeah. So yeah if, you know, if you come close, all right, we got money, then we can we can start. So yeah, yeah I, I get the Kickstarter close, and if there's still another couple thousand, I put up that couple thousand, and that's then right. I, I started GoFundMe to help pay back that <laughs> couple thousand that I did for the Kickstarter. <laughs> there's a system. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think you see the the throughway there, so that's that's good to see. I. <laughs> I, you know, honestly, the other thing, Chip, and, and truly, I, I started talking about this with Heidi McDonald last Friday on a, on a live stream, and we were talking about how when things do open up again, it's going to be a different world in the comic shop because the ability to browse is going to change. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I mean, thank God that, you know, most comic publishers and even independents know smart enough that they will have a website and you can see interior pages and stuff like that. But you can't pick up a book and flip anymore until this is really under control and there's a vaccine and we can hopefully move forward. I yeah, mean, I, I, mean, I don't know. I, I feel like those habits have already kind of shifted a lot because you have so much access online to what's coming up and previews and stuff. I mean, you know, back in the day, it was like the only way you could figure out what you wanted to buy in the shop. Sure. Um, uh, now you, you kind of go in knowing and you kind of flip through the other comics just to kind of see what's going on. Right. Um, and there'll be less of that. Um, maybe it'll just incentivize people to actually just buy the comics instead of just flipping through them in the well, store. That's true. Get them home, spray them down, put them in the oven, kill all the bacteria. I don't know. 
how people are going to treat their comics. Um, yeah, yeah. But it'll, yeah, it'll, it'll be an interesting world. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. But that, that's the thing. It's that discovery because I mean, I I mean, I know that I you know fine. I come with my my list of what I want to buy. Hmm. But then you know you do you see a cover and oh what's that about? Oh okay. Well let me look inside and everything. And yeah, like I said. That ability, unless, you know, now, and I mean, I guess stores too would likely be cooler about, you know, people opening up their phone or their tablet or whatever and kind of flipping and saying, what's this about this book about? But yeah, yeah it's going to be, it's just going to be weird, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. None of us have a crystal ball. I, no. I, none of us can kind of predict how this is going to go. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, have, I, have a, I have a real affinity for comic shops, like not just because um, I, I rely on them for uh, keeping me alive, but um, you know the direct market for its all its flaws. Like uh, I, I have fond memories of like being a kid and uh, and in high school and like going into a comic shop and like having it be one of the only kind of retail places where it felt like it was for me and it felt like I was home in a lot of ways. Um, and and yeah, if if we if we lose that, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be really sad, I think. Yeah, the commu the lack of community, and no, what you just said about comic shops. I mean, yeah, that and record stores, obviously. I think, mm -hmm. and yeah. I, and and I do. I f I feel bad for kids that are losing that connectivity, and mm -hmm. as independent bookshops and and uh, record stores, and now you know comic books and stuff are. Yeah, but there's always there's always a market for well curated uh, retail. I think. Because uh, that's that's going to be the way going forward. Like, you 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 don't go into the shops now. I mean, we don't go into shops now, but uh, generally you don't go into the shops um, to go in, get the thing that you know you want, and leave. Like, you go in to discover things, um, uh, and and that's why the independent bookstores, especially like in my neighborhood around Toronto, uh, the ones that uh, thrive, stay alive, are the ones that. You walk in there and you find things you hadn't thought of before, because um, they curate and they show you things that uh, that uh, the staff loves to read, that they have heard are interesting, um, uh, and, and and the best comic shops do that as well. They anticipate your needs instead of just providing the product and just sitting back and waiting for you to come in and decide what you want. We could all get comics delivered to our home. We could all like buy them digitally or whatever. Um, but it, but it's a very different thing than going into a shop and um, uh, discovering, you know, with a, like a, a preconceived idea. Yeah, and good I, record shops and good bookstores do that, and I think great comic shops do that as well. The Beguiling in Toronto is uh, is like one of the only comic shops in the past like five years that uh, uh, has expanded. Like they 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 grown and grown since they moved to the new location. They took over the shop next to them. They took over the shop next to them. Wow! And 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 their basement is massive. Like it, it's 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 strangely huge. Um, and it's because it's a shop that uh, curates and does outreach and um, shows you what you're missing. Which uh, which is why I, I have I have no doubt they're going to survive this. That's cool. I um, challenges in Chicago mm -hmm. uh, weirdly had just expanded to a second location yeah. uh, a couple months before the shutdown, and uh, yeah, no, they're and they're smart. They're, they're they're good curators too of their stores, and they they're they're very wise in terms yeah. of how they run their shops. Yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah. I mean, I, obviously, we all hope for the best, and um, I'm sure that again, it's during these tough times that. Uh, creative retailers can adapt and figure yeah. out different innovative ways. And that's, you know, I, I do think that will be the, the, the optimistic byproduct of this situation is that we'll get more retail creativity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Just creativity across the board in terms of how to, how to exist. Right? Yeah. Jesus. All right. Yeah. This is bumming me out. Let's, let's move back to the comics. I, I think it's, I think it's actually a positive thing. Like, I think, <laughs> I think, <laughs> you know, it might, it might be bumming you out, but it's like, nah, it gives me a lot of hope, like kind of knowing, like you, you knew it before this that you know comics is a community, but um, seeing the, the the outreach and outpouring of like um, charity initiatives and um, people supporting uh, shops and creators, 
yeah, yeah, there's not a lot of industries like that, I think. Um, I think you're right. So it's, it's, it's small and it's tight, but, you know, it really, uh, really creates a feeling of hope in, uh, in how we're going to handle this on the other end. I agree. And honestly, uh, it's, I, I've felt the love from the community as well with this podcast, and, and I really appreciate it. And also, uh, have done what I can in uh, doing a, a few charity things. And, um, you know, yeah, I, you, again, this is, uh, this is where creativity comes from. This is why I started doing video. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm like, all right, I got the time. Let's, uh, let's, let's uh, see about uh, adding that component to Word Balloon. You did video because you're hot as hell. You know it. On, I know let, it. You know, right now. Let's not beat around the bush. All right. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I especially with the hat on, mm -hmm. I think I look like, uh, like John Candy at the end of Stripes. Win a dream date with Ox, America's new team, Heartthrob. You, you, you look like you like announce UFC matches or something. All right. <laughs> yeah, I don't I know. The, I, I don't mean to brag. I got the big microphone, obviously, as well. So. Yeah. But that's Same always... That's, <laughs> and a boy. Hey, Twinsies. that's awesome. Look Twinsies. at us, man. We're yeti. I think we're, we're, I think we're both doing it wrong. I think you're not supposed to point it at you. You're supposed to like, no, point no, it at you. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know, man. I... Uh, you see, and again, my old movies and stuff. I think of uh, Bill Stern during Pride of the Yankees. This is a big day for big Billy, for little Billy in the hospital. <laughs> Not only Babe Ruth, but Lou Gehrig is, is going to hit a home run for him. <laughs> so good stuff, man. I uh, oh, Alex Chung. Here's a question. Spider-Man Life Story was amazing. Uh, it's not a question, but it's a it's a comment, and I agree. Life Story was amazing. Excellent job all around. Yeah, you and Bagley and 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 crew. Uh, a great. Spider-Man story that we weren't expecting to need, but uh, really a tremendous look at the decades and a great alternate history for Spider-Man. Great, yeah, story. yeah. I'm, I'm happy with how it turned out. You know, while while you're working on a thing like that, you know, you, you question it at every stage, <laughs> uh, especially a project like that, which felt uh, a lot like a um, um, an exercise, like 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 trying to puzzle out pieces and how to make them fit together and how to make it just work on a level. Um, but to actually have it work and be narratively satisfying is, uh, uh is all I could have ever hoped for. Did you ever read back in the day? And I don't know if we talked about this when it was coming out, uh, when John Byrne did generations. The I, Superman I didn't. Um, obviously when they announced life story, a lot of people asked me about that and, uh, I hadn't, I just kind of, after the announcement, I, 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 checked out like just what it was about and um yeah yeah it's a, it's a great idea and i'm i'm happy to have <laughs> replicated it uh obviously well, they're a little different because it's like yes basically following golden age and kind of taking them into the the future but uh but yeah yeah, yeah but they're also cool. different characters and different experiences to mine so mm -hmm. yeah that was yeah honestly i mean the trope is the same but but yeah. again i think a, you're a different creator, and and you know that's that's fine. I think yeah. uh, they are different books. And, and my understanding too is like when I uh, talked to Tom Brevoort, who was the editor on it about the project, um, he made it clear right from, from the outset. He's like, "Oh yeah, this has been pitched to me several times." Okay. Um, uh, but he he liked elements of my pitch, which is why he finally kind of went with it. And he even had like a, a title for it off to the side in case this ever got greenlit. And the title he had was Marvel Age, which oh, is fun. perfect. Sure. Marvel and aging. But I guess Marvel they had too many things kind of wrapped up already with that title. Uh, like there was like obviously the classic uh, book and then sure. the um, uh, they had like a kid's line or something. And so they didn't want to create any confusion. So a new title uh, uh, suited them better. But it, I, that was always stuck in my head. I'm like, oh, Marvel Age is the perfect title. As you've been writing Marvel books, um, do you find yourself like, has your style changed to adapt to the bigger shared universe that you have to do when you do Marvel books? Or, you know, are do you feel like you're still kind of pitching and writing the same way when you initially were breaking into Marvel as a writer? Um, I mean, well, once I started, once I signed up exclusive and started doing the, uh, the retreats, I felt more a part of the, the universe. Cause uh -huh. at that point you're pitching out things and helping people with their projects as well. Um, and, and you obviously, you have to reflect what's happening in the other books. Like how sure. the duck was easier because you could reflect it, but kind of not like, yeah, you know, I put captain America in the book, 
it had to be like old man Steve Rogers because that's how he was. But you can kind of poke fun at it at the same time. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm always I always bristle at um, you know the kind of the crossovers and stuff and being kind of roped into those. Sure, um, but that's stupid of me. And I, I think it was Hickman that pointed out uh, once, but maybe it was to me or just kind of in my vicinity. But he was like, "This is part of it. You have to support each other. You have to like." You have to, you have to, you have to play this game and like um, deliver the best product you can while while enriching other people's books in the universe. Uh, so that that kind of made me kind of reconsider that stance a bit, um, you know, because there's there's crossover stuff coming up, and you know they've asked me if Daredevil can tie into it, and if it suits the tone, um, for sure. It's, it's funny I've been rereading again. Um, and Ascenti's Daredevil run. Sure. Um, and I was reading like, I think early on in the run, maybe even the first issue was a, like a Follow the Mutants tie-in. I'm like, Follow the Mutants? I didn't remember that. That's fantastic. And you read it and like, she does such a great job of making it a Daredevil story. Like Follow the Mutants is like, you know, X Factor um, and Apocalypse and like Apocalypse's ship hitting New York and stuff like is pretty big and grand. So she just focused on like street gangs and like people that is like underground law office and these kids and ethical situations just on that, on that weird level and like blackouts and um, uh, riots and things. And it, it's so great. Like in, in one issue, she um, has so many interesting characters and uh, interactions and it feels very much like a daredevil story um, framed by, these giant Marvel things that are happening. Um, and yeah, reading that, I'm like, oh man, like there's, there's a way to do it. Uh, and sometimes I selfishly pull myself out of it. You know, like I'm just like, well, no, I don't want to be a part of this because I've got my story and I got to do my story. And it's like, well, lean into it, take it as a challenge and kind of figure out um, uh, how could Daredevil you know, be with Secret Wars 9 or whatever Marvel sure. got cooking. Like, <laughs> what's, what's a way to aid my story and their story and uh, let readers feel like this is this is a, a shared universe? Yeah. I get it. No, and, I, and that's that was going to be my observation too, is that the more limits they put on you, the more creative you've got to be. Yeah, to to satisfy yourself on the story, and I and I again, I think that the better creators are able to do that. So, I agree with uh, you and Hickman. I think that's that's good. Oh, here's yeah. a good one, uh, Man Man Frogler. How many five year olds chip fight at once? Oof. I mean, I wish I could say that's a hypothetical because <laughs> I've been down that road before. Do you have a five year old, uh, or is it just your no. haunting, uh, schoolyards and you know? Challenging. I, I, I realized it was like a year or two ago, um, a lot of nieces and nephews and we were visiting them and I've always considered myself to be, you know, fun uncle chip and, sure. you know, uh, we're at the playground and we're running around and stuff. And I think at one point I'm like, I'm up on the playground equipment. I go to slide down the fireman's pole and like my grip kind of loosens a bit too quickly and I just like drop. <laughs> so I don't slide. I just fall <laughs> and my feet hit the ground in such a way that like I couldn't walk, like walking was like so painful. And it turned out like quite damaged <laughs> my feet. Oh, and I was on like a crutch for, uh, for like a month afterwards as I got orthotics for me. And like my feet have wow. never been the same since. And I'm just like, Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm past 40. Like, what am I doing? Chip, I've been there. I understand. And it's yeah. Uncle John, let's play it. I'm like, uh, Uncle John's going to be in the chair. You guys go ahead and play. <laughs> yeah, like as a kid, I remember like the young fun uncles, and I remember yeah. the older uncles off to the side, and I just caught their, thought they were sticking to mugs, but really yeah. they were just desperately trying to stay alive. Right, we're, we're tired and we're brittle, exactly. <laughs> and that's, that's me right now. I'm just trying to stay alive. <laughs> stay away from me, five-year-olds. I need to live. You're killing me, man. Oh, my it's God. It's the worst. Jesus, I understand. Oh, man. Uh, officer Gleason, Chip, can you please talk more about making Matt a probation officer? Sure. Yeah, it seemed like uh, like a natural extension of uh, what I wanted to do with him in a, a post Daredevil life. the The lawyer stuff's always been tricky. Um, like when when Matt is a defense attorney, um, it's it's super weird that he also goes out and beats people up. Uh, sure. 
uh, when he's, you know, a prosecutor, it's doubly weird that he goes out and beats people <laughs> up. Like it, it, it is, it, um, I, I knew that I wanted to, to have a shift in, um, his priorities and his career, uh, at the end of that first arc when we pick up with him weeks or months later. And, uh, parole officer felt like, uh, a way he could help, um, uh, people who have been through the system kind yeah. of reintegrate. Um, and it, it felt like it tied in well to his abilities, like in terms of kind of like keeping an eye on them, making sure that they're able to stay on the, the straight and narrow. Um, yeah. It's, it's weird because like I introduced that element and um, partly for story reasons. So I could uh, introduce the, uh, the brother of the man he murdered um, as one of his uh, clients. Yep. Um, but then, you know, Matt's life goes way off the rails and he's out there, you know, with Electra and all this stuff. So, like, his day job kind of took a backseat uh, to it all and uh, continues to. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if he'll actually get back to it. Like, stuff happens after issue 20 that will um, influence that. Okay. But yeah, but yeah it, it, it was. Your hand. All right. Very cool. It was it was interesting to give him kind of a, a new career that somehow tied into his previous careers, yeah. Um, and uh, and 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 work to to help people uh, while not being daredevil. Yeah. No, I get it. And again, yeah, you're right. And it, it is a way for him to still be the guardian of Hell's Kitchen and 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 help people out. And I, you mm-hmm. know, I think again back to Born Again and well, and even prior to that, just the way he helped out uh, Melvin the glad the gladiator and stuff, and you know. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, superhero comics obviously focus on, you know, stopping the crime. But there are a lot of elements to crime <laughs> yeah. that uh, precede the crime and things that come after the crime. And uh, and a lot of that is about the legal system and um, um, and, and how that takes a toll on, on, on people and maybe doesn't rehabilitate them the way we think it would. Um, and I like introducing that element to, to Matt's life to try and stop the crime before it happens, try and um, help the criminal rehabilitate afterwards. Sure. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's a thing that like more superhero comics can kind of explore um, instead of just the, uh, the fight scenes. I mean, it's easier in Daredevil because we're kind of a bit more leeway. Like we don't have to have like the big fight every issue the way uh, most comics at Marvel and DC do. Um, because we are telling a, a different kind of story, it's a different kind of character. But um, but yeah, there's a lot of elements of violence and crime that uh, that kind of fascinate me, and uh, I want to keep exploring in the title. Very cool. I also felt, uh, as you said before, the dichotomy of him being a defense attorney uh, and then still going out and beating up uh, criminals and stuff. I you know I thought they did that well in the the Affleck movie, honestly. Yeah. And I kind of like the mo- the movie a lot more than many people do. Yeah, um, I think there are a lot of good good ideas. I think that the comic book movie and television shows have evolved since then. Yeah, uh, and certainly I think the Netflix show is fantastic, and I'm I'm really excited to see whatever uh, happens on Disney Plus with uh, with them moving forward because I'm sure yeah. they've got some ideas brewing for new Dare- Daredevil ideas. And yeah, yeah, I'm I'm super interested as well. Obviously, sure, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I was upset when the Netflix show was canceled because I loved it as a fan. It took some pressure off of me um, in a lot of ways because the uh, uh, you kind of know when you're working on the book that if there's a property in development, like maybe you have to reflect it or maybe what you do ends up will end up being reflected in the TV show itself. Um, yeah, I think, I think at, at, at the one retreat where I, um, I pitched Daredevil to the room, uh, I, I met uh, I met Eric. Joe Joe introduced me to Eric, who is the showrunner of season three of Daredevil. Oh, and I, I think he said, "Oh yeah, we're looking forward to your take." I'm like, "Oh, I'm doing a romantic comedy." I'm like, just being an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but like at that moment, I'm like, "Oh yeah, there's gonna be eyes on this. Like this is gonna be. It might be tricky to get through the things that I want to get through." Um, and then uh, yeah, when I found out the show was canceled, I was like, "Oh fuck!" Like as a fan, like. I want to see more of it, but as a creator, I'm like, okay, well, you can step back and breathe a bit because um, there's less focus on on it. And, it, and and weirdly, like the comic feels like a bit of a continuation of the show 
in some ways. Like I, I, I'd written a couple of issues before season three had come out. And then when I was watching season three, I'm like, oh, this is actually tying in nicely with some of the stuff I'm doing. So um, that, that felt exciting. I can't wait to put this question up or comment from Dante Hicks. I want to see if it covers our faces on the screen. Oh, good. Yes, it does. Mm. <laughs> that is so cool and nice. I remember him signing at uh, New York City with Adam Kubert for Peter Parker, and it was one of the hottest days, and Chip was so cool, considerate, and nice that he bought me a case of water and gave water, uh, or he bought a case of water and uh, gave water to, out to fans waiting to meet him and Adam uh, to get their stuff signed. Oh, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, That's that, was, that, was, that was quite the day. Um, you know, it's, I, I love doing signings and I, I miss them. Um, yeah. but like, I don't know, doing one in New York is like, it's kind of a whole other level and, um, sure. especially for like an issue one Spider-Man. And I remember you had the lineup was crazy and it was like boiling hot. Like I remember getting there and seeing that line, I'm like, Oh shit. Like people are going to pass out <laughs> like, cause like the event didn't start for like another hour. So yeah, I, I got some water and, and handed it out. That's cool, and that was a, that was a cool signing too, because like it's my first time meeting Adam, and uh, and he was super cool and nice, and we sit down, we start signing, and um, all of a sudden, like I notice, you know, you know, people are bringing him comics to sign, and uh, as we're signing, someone will bring like some cool copy of a comic that he did that I used to own, and like it clicked at that moment, I'm like oh, Adam Kubert, I'm doing a book with Adam Kubert, like you know it going in, but like when you actually see. You know, it was like a copy of X-Men where like Wolverine's like adamantium was being pulled out of him. It was like fatal attractions or whatever, a hologram in the corner. Sure. And someone put that down like, oh, I remember buying that and like just falling in love with it and the art. And like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting next to a living legend. Like, this is super cool. And then, you know, we went for dinner afterwards. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I met his wife and uh, we just had like the best time and like, just him telling stories of his dad and comics yeah, and, yeah. uh, and, uh, yeah, that was, that was a really remarkable day. That was, um, definitely a highlight. It's nice when you meet people in comics and they turn out to be really cool. hundred percent buddy. Yes. And, and, and personable. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in some cases people are, uh, antisocial, but it kind of comes with being a comics creator because you are alone all day. And sometimes you lack the ability to, uh, interact with humans. <laughs> Um, I, yeah. but, it, but in, in other cases, like people are like gregarious and fun and uh, interesting and, and, and cool. And that's a lot of fun. That's awesome, man. No, I, I agree. And it's funny early on, uh, Mike Norton, uh, and I, you know, I, I had him on a few times and we're both Chicago guys and, uh, and I couldn't tell if I was bugging Mike cause you know, I don't want to be that guy yeah, and really yeah, of 15 years of doing word balloon. <laughs> it's like. I, I think I know who my friends are of the creators and the ones that it's like, you know, good to see you, but you know, they or we just don't know Bye. each other. Well enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but Mike was like, you know, I'm like, Hey man, I hope I'm not bothering you. And he's like, John, I'm sorry. He goes, you gotta remember I'm in front of a draft table all day. And he goes, I forget how to be social. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you're not bothering me. We're friends. We are yeah, friends. Yeah, so I'm I, like, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I find like when I'm doing shows, like there's a weird thing that happens several times during a, an appearance where, Someone will want a photo with you, and uh, you'll go to take the photo, and you know you have your arm around each other, or whatever, sure. and you can feel them just shaking. They're just shaking because they're nervous. Yeah. And I always just say to them, I'm like, look, like I'm the one that should be nervous. I'm the one that works in my garage all day, <laughs> and doesn't see a human being. Like, trust me, you're better off in this situation than than I am. Um. Yeah. Yeah. All just people. Yeah, and, I'll, and you know, and this again, I was uh, Heidi and I were talking about this, and I said it's the blues. Being a blues music fan is like that, where I think the fandom, the the, the artists really do appreciate the fandom, and that there is that just a bit of a higher connectivity level, mm -hmm. where where there it's like you know, and they and they show up to all the shows, and it's like, oh hey man, good to see you again. Oh yeah, so you know, and now I know who you are, and and truly, I, I you know, uh, there's a there's an Ottawa uh, comic uh, collector and an original art collector Wayne. And I always forget how to pronounce Wayne's. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know Wayne. Yeah, Wayne's awesome. You know, yeah, yeah man. And Wayne, Wayne has over the years become a friend. And you know, we, again, he came out for C2E2, and we were having lunch the day before and hanging out and stuff. And you know, and I, I mentioned him to Fowler because he's they're both Ottawa mm -hmm. guys. And yeah. he's like, he goes, oh yeah, I know Wayne. And I'm like, cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a small community. Yeah. And you know, uh, the other part of having a small community is you kind of know who the assholes are too. Sure. 
like like words word travels fast when someone's <laughs> when someone's being a bit of a dick or a diva and you're just like mm. uh that that's nice too i actually really appreciate that it, it keeps it keeps people in check like it's you, you don't get away with shit if like not like if you were like a hollywood celebrity or something like that 100% now yeah. we haven't talked about uh fantastic 4 and x men Mm. And uh, that's another one that you're, you know, three issues in. Is it only four issues? Total? It's only four issues. So similar to Daredevil, it's like the last issue of, you know, the big arc. This is the one that's sitting there at the printer. Yeah, yeah. So we are three issues in. Great idea for a story, man. And and that and and also kind of pointing out this kind of father and son barrier that's there right now between Franklin and Rita. And I really mm. love that scene in the first issue when Franklin and, and Ben are, are eating. And yeah. he's like. You know, isn't it weird that the two people that dad can't figure out are you and me? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, dude, those are the those are the character moments that get me giddy. And I'm just yeah. like, oh, Chip gets it. There it is, man. There's that there's that moment where both characters are speaking truth. And I think that's fantastic. It's it's the eternal question, obviously, the you know, the Ben Grimm, Reed Richards, somehow Reed can't fix him. Um it, it's it's well covered ground that I, I recognize that. And I think just adding Franklin to that mix um, changes it up slightly. Um, uh, yeah. Cause you're, you, you kind of, yeah, you, a lot of fantastic four X-Men is kind of going back to the well in, in a lot of cases with the relationships, um, especially since like the original fantastic four X-Men mini is my all time favorite mini. And I'm, I'm really playing off of that as much as I am the current FF run and current X-Men stuff. Um, I knew I wanted to do it after um, hearing Hickman's pitch in the room for all the X-Men stuff. Um, it was so cool and everybody loved it and everybody had questions galore and it was just so uh, giant uh, to hear it for the first time. And um, and yeah, Tom Brevoort wanted me to do more Fantastic Four stuff after uh, Marvel 2 and 1 ended. Yeah. It was about to end. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, I, there was the option to keep going with the book, but uh, it just felt weird knowing that there was like an FF book, like, okay, what role are we filling here then? Um, uh, so I, we all kind of chose to end it at 12 and, and Tom was like, do you want to do a Fantastic Four quarterly minis? Like, what do you want to do? And, um, and I, I turned them down cause I'm like, well, uh, I kind of want to tell like an ongoing thing. I want to tell like a, a story that impacts the characters. Like the, the one-offs are fun, but um, I kind of wanted to do something more with them. And uh, he kind of sent me away knowing that uh, the way I work is I, I'm usually down on something and then I go off and I think about it and then I have an idea and I come back. And uh, and yeah, like um, uh, hearing Hickman's pitch and also getting to read the, the script for the first issue of House of X, I was like, oh, we've got to do something with Franklin. Like this is the question and um, uh, it should be kind of like brought up earlier rather than later, at least in terms of like creating tension. Um, so yeah, then, then it became tricky because the book is a fantastic four book. Like it's in the fantastic four office, mm -hmm. but we had to get the buy-in of the X-Men office, uh, including Hickman and the FF office, including Dan. Um, and so uh I had slight nerves kind of writing up the pitch for it in terms of like what kind of notes I'm going to get. Um, Cause you know, obviously uh, uh, Hickman's protective of what they're doing and to have a book kind of outside that kind of answering a question that he set up. Um, I, I, I knew I was probably coming out of the gate a bit earlier than he wanted it to be. Um, but it, it was too late at that point. <laughs> like basically they were like, yep, yeah, it's approved. We're doing it. Now we just got to get approval from these guys. And uh, the book was happening with or without me at that point. Um, it was on the schedule. Uh, so um, the, the funny thing is the notes that came back were um, Dan didn't really have any notes. He had like one main note, which was easily addressed um, and a request, which was also addressed. And um, Hickman's notes were mostly fantastic four based. Because he'd written those characters for so long, that sure. he'd be like, mm, "I run. think, I think Reed would do be more like this. I think Doom would kind of do a bit of this." Um, and there were solid notes, and uh, um, there's no one I respect more in comics than uh, Hickman. Uh, uh, 
Uh, Mercy Madonna asks, uh, is, is he easy to work with, Jonathan? Yeah, like one of the surprising things, um, you know, I, I, met him, I met him at Heroes Con several years ago. It was a dinner with like Matt and, and, and Hickman and a couple others. And uh, I'm definitely intimidated because you know how smart he is. Um, <laughs> yeah. But he's, a, he's a delight as a person. And, um, I and, agree. Uh, uh, and he, 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 he was just so free with his advice, not in terms of like, you got to do this and you got to do that, but like how to work with editors and, um, um, yeah, what's the best way to approach things. And then going to the retreats with him there, uh, he's the most giving with his ideas. Um, like he's there to support everyone. There's, there's like, of course there's ego there. There's ego there with all of us in the room, but, um, uh, with him, it's like transcended ego in a weird way. Like he's so smart. He's so good at what he does. He's very comfortable with the fact that he hovers above mortals. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't look down on us. Like he's a giving God, right? Like, <laughs> so, so his advice is always like really sound and, um, and really smart and, uh, um, and, and helpful. And, and he, he's good with feedback as well. Uh, yeah, he's he's a delight. He really is, and I, uh, he's just the right amount of evil. <laughs> like, I, I I take glee when like there's a twinkle in his eye and he's telling you something just kind of m malicious or evil, and you're just like, oh, I love you so much. <laughs> it's been fun watching John, uh, knowing him as long as I have when he first joined Marvel and was like the new kid and mm -hmm. and having great ideas. And uh, the way he maps out stories and things, but also uh, now, like you said, that he is kind of graduated to be one of the grand old men. I mean, yeah, 10, twelve years later, eleven years later, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, he's I got, get it. He's got great taste, and uh, um, he's he's able to see the potential in a lot of younger creators. Like I think the X Men line um, mm -hmm. is becoming more uh, diverse and open, and. Uh, uh, it's, it's partly why I hesitate to pitch X Men books, um, uh, because you know they've 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 approached me before about like doing stuff within the X Men side of things. Um, maybe they feel differently after seeing X Men Fantastic Four, but um, uh, I, I hesitate uh, partly because I, I don't think they need another. Well, like, an old white guy, frankly, like um, the stuff okay. that's being produced right now that feels really exciting. Um, they're they're younger creators, um, uh, uh, and uh, much more interesting than than I am. And um, and there's a hunger there too to tell the stories and a hunger for the work. And uh, um, I think it's really coming through in the product. I think it's very interesting. Uh, comics that are being produced in that office right now. And and I think if I went in, I don't know if I'm interesting enough for it. Maybe I'm just down on myself, but I don't, I don't, unless I had like an amazing idea and I, I, I went in, like I'd have to be all in. I'd have to be all in. Like, like during this, I was a part of their Slack, which is like a lot of fun, like seeing all these uh, writers bouncing stuff around and um, just seeing how all in they were on, um, like X of Swords, that's coming up. Okay. Um, in a way where, uh, again, kind of harkening back to earlier in the conversation, I don't know if I had the energy for it, um, but they're coming up with a wild, fantastic ideas and playing off of each other, and uh, it's so it was so cool just to like kind of uh, listen in on that. That I don't know if my contributions would be up to par with what's being produced there. I understand. Yeah. I, I am interested also because uh, I want to talk about uh, Terry Dotson drawing uh, the uh, miniseries. Yeah. And yeah, I, and I'll be talking to Terry in the weeks ahead with his Adventure Man book coming up. But um, He agreed to do the book because of you. Stop it. Yeah, yeah, because he heard me on your uh, podcast. I think we were talking about like um, uh, the old Justice League run with Giffen, Dummy Tease, and McGuire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And talking about like the, the kind of that fun quality to the superhero team book. And uh, I, I was talking to him in Seattle after he agreed to do the book. And he's like, Yeah, you know, I'm, he wasn't really looking for anything, but like he, he heard that podcast and he's just like, Oh, yeah, Chip, Chip gets it. 
like, like that's a, amazing. aligned with what he wanted to do in comics, and um, and that was that was a major part of why he said yes. Wow. So well, once seems- once again, you saved my ass. You you gave me <laughs> ideas for invaders during a podcast. <laughs> You got That's Terry it. Dodson. Uh, what's going to happen from this? Who knows? I don't know, man. I, well, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm glad you're. I'm your good luck charm, Chip. That's yeah, that's yeah. great to hear. Seriously, man, that was incredibly flattering, and I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't want I, my ego wouldn't allow me to do it. But seriously, that was so lovely that when we were talking about invaders and Namor going bad, and I'm like, well, what's 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 Sue? Th- you know, what does Sue Storm think about? I this? know, and I'm like, what is she thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so thrilled that you put it into the story because I'm like, yeah, man, there you go. And yeah. again, that's why it doesn't surprise me that Tom was like, what else do you want to do with the FF? And he, or continue two in one because it's funny. I remember, and this oh, actually, again, uh, young enough to say that I didn't read the original stories, but I want to say in Strange Tales, when they had the Human Torch stories, mm-hmm. a lot of them were Thing and, and uh, Human Torch stories yeah. together. Yeah. So there is room for that existing alongside an FF book. Yeah, for sure. I, I think just the idea of the FF coming back, the focus needed to be on that main title. Sure. Um, and uh, and and also, like I, I just finished Spectacular Spider-Man, which was the mm-hmm. second book to Dan on Amazing. True. Yes. And uh, I enjoyed it, but you're you're kind of dancing between the raindrops a little bit. I get um, it. And to to undertake that again was like with a with frankly a, a, a less popular property. <laughs> Like it is kind of, you can have a second Spider-Man book and have it do okay. A second Fantastic Four book, maybe not as I'm hot. Not, yeah, yeah. Um, so there would be the danger of just all the readers who went to two and one to get their FF fix, just basically leaving, going to FF, and me just kind of like doing all these stunts to try and keep interest up, while also not advancing the characters much because FF is that's Dan's job. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. There's all sorts of factors when it comes to making a decision. But the main one is you have a story, and I didn't because the story was about them grieving. Uh, and I had I had a storyline set up um, uh, where Reed and Sue still don't come back, but um, Ben and Johnny uh, end up with Franklin and Val, and they have to like be the uncle dads, the my two dads yeah. sitcom yeah. scenario where they. Yeah. Um, they they have to raise the kids without reading Sue there, but but that got scrapped because of uh, of the FF coming back legit. So yeah, so no story, um, right, probably uh, less ability to to uh, maintain it. Going. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I can appreciate that. I uh, oh, I was going to ask regarding the miniseries. Um, you've got those pages that are very Hickman esque in terms of the stats and everything, and I was so wondering. Pages, yeah. Yeah, tell me, tell me about those. Are, are like, is that you know, because you're kind of playing in the Hickman esque X Men? I mean, or yeah, those, those, I mean, those were very deliberate because I wanted something that evoked what's happening in X Men, but also had the Fantastic Four flavor to it. Um, so making them kind of reads data pages with that kind of Fantastic Four blue, like blueprints, um, felt like a good a good uh, combination of those two. Like I, I did the design for for the book. So I did like the um, the the credits pages. I I I drew and designed all of those data pages, um, and the logo stuff like that. Like uh, all of that's really important to me, and I really enjoy doing it. Um, uh, and to be able to have control over what elements from which you're incorporating, like on the, on the title pages, like I made sure it was kind of like a blue and gold, because those are the colors that kind of represent both teams. Yep. Absolutely. Um, well, keeping kind of the circle imagery and like the uh, the, the cool design um, uh, that uh, Hickman and uh, and his team have been doing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Very. There, there, there's some. I can't wait for Shafor to come out because there is like um, there is a, a data, a couple of data pages that are are very reminiscent of um, the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. Ha! That's great. Or like I really I I do technical drawings, uh, based on some of Terry's art, where I like really kind of explore the items. That's great. Um, yeah, and that's that's a ton of fun. That's a ton Jeez. of fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's weird having had this book done for a while now, and you know we're just sitting here just like, oh, I just want people to read it. You know. I yeah, because the I'm, I'm, yeah I'm really jazzed about the ending. Like, it's it's like the last two or three pages of the book are like. 
I don't think I've been this excited to have a thing kind of go out into the world. Wow. As, as these last few pages, just to that's, like see what the reaction is going to be. That's good to hear. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, well, there you go, man. When you're ready to announce the new stuff, we'll have to, uh, you know, roll back and, and then talk about this uh, final issue and, uh, and the whole mini series a bit mm-hmm. more. Now, Marvel Spank asks, any CON here yet? And I don't know what that means. I don't know if you knew what that meant. I don't know, man. Mar- <laughs> Marvel Spank, explain yourself. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, man. Exactly. Unless, you, unless that's code for someone else that might be watching. So uh, that's that's fine. Tell me about chip, the one shot. That chip do- on net. I don't know. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, tell me about the Doom 2099 uh, one shot. Yeah, yeah. That was just kind of a, a rare, cool chance to um, kind of reinterpret one of my favorite uh, comics. Like, I love the 2099 line. And, me too. Um, Nick Spencer. And Doom in particular. Yeah, yeah. Doom, Doom was like, uh, uh, Spider-Man 2099 was awesome. Like, Rick Leonardi's art uh was just just giant for me um uh but yeah doom 2099 was like um such a refreshing uh storyline like just setting up that mystery of whether or not he's the real doom and you know having him yeah. kind of work his way up through those first like 25 issues uh was a was a pretty awesome way to debut a comic i completely uh, agree yeah and yeah so like you know we we knew they were going to do these like 2099 one shots and uh, Nick Spencer was doing kind of a, a whole thing coming out of amazing Spider-Man and, uh, and yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, I jumped at the chance to do the doom one and uh, it was a lot of fun because like I wanted to make sure I created a bit of a mystery and a kind of a surprise at the end, um, staying true to the spirit of the original while Absolutely. updating it for the new world that uh, Nick and the rest of the people kind of created. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's fun doing the the, the done in ones, especially when you have like um, uh, extra pages to do it. Like, I think that was a thirty page issue, so you can kind of tell a bit of a longer story. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was a ton of fun. And I got to i I got to design the um, the uh, or at least do the initial design for like the future Doom armor. Like that was part of like kind of my 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 pitch was drawing that up. And, uh, and seeing it reinterpreted by the the various artists. Outstanding. Uh, yeah. That's great. Yeah, once in a while I get to do that. Like, I, I redesigned a vulture for Spectacular Spider-Man um, just to kind of quick sketches and sent them off to um, the artist on the free comic book day issue. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's nice to see those things continue. Like, the vulture still kind of has that basic costume now. I'm like, oh, yeah, I did that. That's fun. That's awesome. All right, Mar- Marvel so, Spank explained himself, by the way. Council of Nerds. Council of Nerds. And I, I, I think we, we would be unofficial members if that is an official. I think, no, I'm, I think I'm forgetting on what his original question was. Like, where well, he are, said any, any, any CON out there. Any so council I, I, of nerds out there. Yeah, so maybe that's a bunch of other uh, people that <sighs> might be watching, and I don't know. Marvel Spank, God bless you. You're a good man, sir. I don't know what you're doing or what you're promoting, but I love it. And uh, Officer Gleason wants more uh, Zadarsko creator own stuff. And then, uh, by the way, uh, Chip has... Uh, yeah. indicated that there are some of those uh, on the way so that's good to know yeah like um uh white trees with chris and matt um we love doing it and we're definitely going to be doing more cool um uh currently chris is uh working on spider verse 2 which is a nice. cool big deal nice um so uh he's got to work on that until a certain point and then uh, he's gonna jump in on the sequel stuff which hopefully we'll properly announce soon um yeah, it was kind of the same deal as before. I kind of asked him, what, what, what do you want to draw? And what do you want to draw kind of dictated where the story goes. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, Chris and Matt are the best. Just the best. And yeah, and then there's, there's, there's a couple more creator-owned things kind of in the works. So, Oof, maybe, maybe soon, maybe. You sound tired, son. I don't blame you. It's all right. No, it's hard just like um, – the one thing I'm finding is it's hard to get into the mindset of writing uh, – fun interesting worlds uh during this period like it, it takes twice as long i think to write a script now uh, okay um and also just writing a thing being like maybe this will come out in 2021 i don't know <laughs> you know right no yeah. I, just, I can appreciate that yeah well i again the work shows that you're very comfortable writing and i'm glad as far as the the, the stuff coming out from marvel yeah. and i am looking forward to uh whatever you've got as far as uh new uh 
new creator owned stuff. And uh, cool. yeah, obviously people are happy to hear the white trees is coming back. So that's cool. Yeah. Excellent stuff, man. What are you, are you, do you have time to watch or read anything or yeah, fuck no. Okay. No, my, my, my wife's work is super busy right now too. And so like, we're both like, uh, where, how are people finding the time to do stuff? Like we just, we have time enough maybe to watch like half an hour of TV every two nights. And then, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, because like everything I'm doing takes longer now, uh, and there's also time that I reserve just for staring at a wall uh, with anxiety. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I, le I legit don't know where uh, people are finding finding time. Uh, I I share the problem honestly, Chip. The yeah. only the only show the only new show that I've watched is on Amazon Prime that Greg Daniels show upload. Good. Is it good? It, it is, and yeah. also, uh, like the first episode is forty-five minutes, but the rest are standard sitcom under thirty. Whew, forty-five minutes. I, well, but it's just it's just the setup, and honestly, I really like it because it's one of those great ten minutes from now, not too far in the distant future, where you can extrapolate where we are right now, especially with technology. Yeah, and and I like I like some of the choices he makes, and it, they're very plausible. Yeah, and uh, so I don't know if you know the general premise or not. Yeah, yeah, I've seen the commercials for okay. it. Okay, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, no, it's, they. Yeah. I think they nail it. I really do think they nail it. And it's and it's um, uh, Steve Amell's brother is uh, the main guy, and I Robbie Robbie Amell. I couldn't think of his name for a second. Right. And and he's really funny. And it's yeah, it's pretty good. I, yeah. I'm 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 pleased. Um, and I really want to see that Netflix Hollywood miniseries. I haven't watched it yet. Yeah, yeah, I feel like those episodes are probably not half an hour. Like, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Well, they probably you're probably right. It is weird. Like, really, the only time I actually kind of watch anything is when I'm having lunch in my studio, and uh, um, I chose to watch uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm because uh, you know David Brothers. David Brothers kind of talks uh, about it once in a while, and I'm just like, oh, maybe I should give it a shot. And um, couldn't watch it in the first week of the pandemic because the anxiety on that show just layered on top of mine. I'm a bit yeah. better at it now, but every time I see there's an episode that's like longer than the 23 minutes or whatever, I'm like, Oh fuck. <laughs> like I'm breaking up episodes and two, like watching half at lunch and half at lunch the next day. Cause I'm like, I don't have time for this. I, I got to get the script that. done. I got to draw this page. Uh, you know, honestly, Chip, I'm, I feel that way doing the podcast and I really have been tripling my usual output per month. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, it helps me cope because yeah. it's stuff like this. This is you and me hanging out, you yeah. know. And 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 really, I love it, and I'm I, I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, no, same here. So yeah, I mean, yeah. so it it does make it easier. But yeah, as far as when I put TV on, I find myself uh, just having wallpaper on in the background and talking wallpaper that I'm, if anything, putting on old old uh, movies that I love or old uh, you know reruns of, of yeah. TV shows, and it's just easier to kind of work while that stuff is in the background versus really sitting down and focusing on something new. Yeah. I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll dip into video games that take sure. place outdoors. <laughs> I really <laughs> like that. I'm playing like Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It's like ancient Greece. And I'm just like on a horse. There's a sunset. There's birds. I'm just like, it's great. That's fantastic. I'm murdering people. Like I just can't murder people anymore. I can't get close enough to them to murder them. The social distancing is really like That's cutting really, into your uh, my, your mass my, killings. I yeah, understand. my murder sprees are down a hundred percent. Chip, what was the thing? Weren't you messing around with some corporate uh, people and and sending them like mad twitters or or am I am I confusing you with James Robinson? Who was doing oh, that? I, I've I've done a few of those. Applebee's, yes, uh, was the main one. Those were nice nice messages <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> Those are very polite. <laughs> People still bring me Applebee's menus to sign at comic conventions. Outstanding. Yeah. That's great. Dude, you're did, and I think we might have talked about this before. Had you ever read Don Novello, one of the great Saturday Night Live writers and uh, his character from the 70s and early 80s, Father Guido Sarducci, this uh, priest from the Vatican and stuff. Yeah. He had a book called The Laszlo Letters where he would send um, – actual mail to you know where they'd say hey if you got any suggestions let us know and um you know all the all the different companies or like there was a timex commercial where somebody found a timex watch washed up on the beach 
And he's like, you know, I, w- I think I was on that beach. That might be my time. I said, do you have a lost and found department? I'd like to pick up my watch. <laughs> and just crazy stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, he he was amazing. My favorite was uh, there was a, there was a gas station during the energy crisis of things you could do to uh, <laughs> to uh, handle you know the, the the crunch of the economy and and still live 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 life with a, with dignity. And some of the recycling ideas he had was the toilet cloth because you can't wash toilet paper. Wow. <laughs> and they'd said yeah, yeah. because they just had these mass certificates of hey thank you for your suggestions here's a little thing so yeah. he would send the reprint of his his response with like a, if he got a little award he got a little <laughs> he'd show the award that he got for the toilet cloth yeah <laughs> good stuff man I, I did get offered a free Applebee's uh, meal after all of that um because their social media blew up. Like it was kind of crazy. Like oh. like my hometown Applebee's, which had like 200 people liking that Facebook page. And then it jumped to like 20,000 in a week. <laughs> Cause like Buzzfeed picked it up and it became a thing. I was like being interviewed on radio and stuff. And, yes. uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, a representative from Applebee's was like, we would love to offer you a, a free meal um, at Applebee's at our location here in Barrie. And uh, and I'm like, oh, okay. And then um, I posted about it. And then the mayor of my hometown uh, basically invited himself as well. Like, you know, I would love to come and, 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 and see you uh, and eat this Applebee's with you. It became a weird publicity thing. And then I was like, oh, man, do I really want to drive an hour to have a lunch I don't want with a man I don't know? And I was like, uh, I think I should just let this one die. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Outstanding, man! Yeah. You're killing me. All right, Chip, I'm gonna let you go right. because this was this was fantastic, and uh, I think we've we've worn out our uh, Facebook and uh, Periscope welcomes. All right, but I uh, but now this is terrific. Congratulations, man! The the books are great. Thanks, and uh, as always, continued success, and looking forward to seeing how uh, this uh, this final uh, chapter of this arc of Daredevil wraps up, mm-hmm. and also, of course, FF uh, uh, X Men, and. Um, yeah, you know, well, whatever else is. Did I miss a Marvel book, uh, Chip? Is there is there a Marvel book we didn't talk about currently? No, no, I'm uh, nothing that's uh, on the uh, schedule. <laughs> All right, beautiful. Yeah. All right, awesome. Excellent. Hey, man, as always, seriously, be well. And uh, God, I, I hope the next time we talk, things are a little more open. But if not, uh, you know, well, if if we need a, a little uh, sanity break, I'm I'm happy to have you back. You're always yeah. welcome, Chip. Yeah, yeah, always uh, happy to be here, especially with your new CNN format. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Live from Toronto. Yeah, I'm, I'm like I am. I'm I'm uh, I'm Greek Anderson Cooper. Exactly. Yes. yes. Perfect. So, All right, man. Buddy, be well. Thank you very yeah, much. You too. All right. Thanks, Chip Zdarsky. Everybody, uh, that that'll wrap things up for uh, this edition of Word Balloon Live. Thanks very much for coming in. Uh, the plan is to talk to Shelley Bond, the wonderful uh, um, an editor, uh, formerly of Vertigo and IDW, and uh, she's had a lot of interesting projects over the years. And I'm happy to welcome her back. So look forward to that on uh, on Friday afternoon. So until next time, thanks a lot for watching. And everybody take care. Stay safe. Stay healthy.